very good morning to everyone and welcome to the Centre for Aging Be Bre Better's Breakfast event this morning. It's so uh, great we've had a, a sell out this morning, so it's great that uh, all of you have come. So it seems this theme of the future of ageing is a very uh, topical one. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anna Dixon, I'm Chief Executive at the Centre for Aging Better. I'd also like to extend a welcome to those who are joining us remotely. So we are live streaming uh, this morning uh, through our YouTube channel. Uh, the recording will also be available after the event. So if you know people who couldn't be here today or couldn't get the tickets, then uh, do share that on and encourage them uh, to read it. I understand there's an opportunity uh, for those who are um, uh, on the live stream to post questions using Slido. So I think details on that will be on your screen now. <clears throat> so at this morning's breakfast, we are going to explore two, two possible futures. The world of ageing badly and the world of ageing better. And I hope through sort of opening our minds a little bit to the future and to two uh, possible future scenarios, it will help us to explore the action that we actually need to take today to ensure that more of us can enjoy our later lives and uh, enjoy uh, our old age. Some of you hopefully in the room might have had a chance to uh, have a look at this infographic depicting the future scenarios over here. And if not, do encourage you to take a look uh, after the event. Before I um, introduce our panellists and uh, ask them each to uh, say a few words, I thought I would just take a few minutes to just start uh, you thinking about the future. So first of all, I would like you to imagine the world of ageing badly. So this is a dystopian future, circa 2040. Technological advances have accelerated, resulting in the widespread automation of jobs. There are high unemployment rates and fewer people contributing taxes. The convenience of virtual shops and drone deliveries mean the high streets and shopping malls are empty. Communities have become unsafe and green spaces no-go areas for older people. Public transport has all but disappeared, with fewer people commuting and travelling into the town. Obesity rates and depression have, uh, have increased, resulting in a reversal in life expectancy gains and higher levels of disability among older adults. Housing is in disrepair. Older, low-income homeowners <coughs> can't afford to keep up with maintenance and rising energy and heating bills. There are more private renters living in poor quality housing and landlords refusing to adapt properties to enable older people to live independently. As a result, there are higher rates of admission to hospital and care homes. Such a world does not seem... Uh, unimaginable does it and I think we see glimpses of it already so now I would like you to imagine the world of aging better so this is a utopian future in 2040 so technology has been harnessed by companies to augment human workers enabling some of those physically demanding jobs to be done by people of all ages without damaging their health and also enhancing their mental processing so as a result Productivity has soared and boosted economic growth. Older entrepreneurs have been encouraged to partner with younger entrepreneurs, combining the technology know-how and the experience. And as a result, more startups are succeeding than ever before. So more people are working for longer and paying taxes for longer. Climate change has driven consumers to seek out products and services from local suppliers and local markets. A movement to create age-friendly communities means that high streets are busy with consumers of all ages. And a major government initiative 20 years ago to focus on prevention and healthy ageing means that people are living longer in good health. And a major investment in communities to boost physical activity with active travel options, a network of public transport, and green spaces where people of all ages can get out and about and keep active 
these have actually reversed obesity trends. And finally, a significant housing building programme 20 years ago, in energy efficient and accessible homes means that lots of options for people in later life to move house and remain independent. And as a result, there are fewer falls and fewer admissions to hospital and care homes. Well, where would you rather live? <laughs> the world of ageing better need not remain a distant dream. I think the public policy decisions that we take today, as I've sort of begun to illustrate, the actions by government, by employers, by business, by public services, and indeed by individuals, I think can put us on a path towards the world of ageing better. And I hope that we'll explore now with our panel some of the ideas about how we might change now to create a better future for us all. So I'd like to firstly invite uh, Professor Linda Grattan, who is Professor of Management <coughs> Practice at the London Business School. Uh, Linda uh, authored a book which I really enjoyed reading, recommended to anybody called The Shift on the Future of Work, and is also uh, co-author of The 100 Year Life with uh, Andrew Scott. So we look forward to hearing what Linda has to say about the future of work. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just want to make a, a, a couple of comments about the future of work. Um, and I, I, I want to really start by making two, two sort of general points. Firstly, technology, what, what's happening with technology? Um, I think 10 years ago when we started thinking about the impact of technology on work, it was all to do with massive robots that were sort of coming striding down the pathway and sort of <laughs> knocking people over, taking your jobs. Actually, uh, I think we're much clearer now about the impact of technology on, on work. Uh, there isn't any evidence that we'll see mass unemployment, but there is a great deal of evidence that all of us and most people around the world will change their jobs. Uh, and they will have to, as a consequence, upskill uh, to do more human skills, which turn out to be more <coughs> complex, or they'll have to completely reskill. And in some cases, particularly in jobs that were considered masculine jobs, like truck driving, uh, that reskilling is taking them into what have historically been thought of as female jobs, like care, caring for others. So, Technology we sort of know a little bit more about, but the real emphasis, I think, on longer lives is that you have to keep learning and training right the way through your life, and I want to say something about that in a second. The second, of course, is longevity. I wrote a book called 100 Years Life, I'm Trying to Live to 100 Years, um, and uh, what that really showed is that uh, for some time now, people have lived longer, and in many cases, more healthily, although we're going to hear much more about some of the inequalities associated with that later on on the panel. I want to make a couple of suggestions about how we make that into a positive rather than a negative scenario, because I think <coughs> the work that you're doing is absolutely crucial. I mean, we have to be positive about what the outcome can be. And, and let me make some suggestions about that. The first is, what, what could we as individuals do? And I think that the, the, my suggestion to an, any individual would be to embrace the idea of a multi-stage life. And what, by that I mean to think less about your life as uh, three stages, full-time education, full-time work, full-time retirement, and more a multi-stage life whereby uh, you, you engage in different activities right the way through your life, you educate yourself right the way through your life, you work right the way through your life, and you also take some of that retirement time and redistribute it back across your life. Um, so we think that's really crucial, and, and, and certainly our, 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 the book 100 Year Life and our, our new book, which will come out in, in May next year, is going to really make that case very, very strongly. We should all be thinking about ourselves in terms of a multi-stage life, not a single, not a three-stage life. But there are real implications for that, and I want to particularly uh, focus on three. Uh, well, four actually, if I include the government. The first is, what about the individual? I, I was just saying, actually, that I write with an economist, I'm a psychologist, and we really uh, struggle with the concept of human agency. So, you know, economists, as you know, see humans as completely rational. Uh, psychologists see humans as completely irrational. And so Andrew and I have tried to sort of steer a course through that. But fundamentally, there is a huge role for human agency. You know, humans, every individual, it really has to take responsibility for their health 
and for their savings. And, and if, if we don't do that, then society, we, we very quickly get into the sort of uh, you know, dystopian future that you spoke to speak of. But actually, of course, you know, that's, it's not fair to say that to every person. And as you'll hear later, there are already growing inequalities for people who can't do either of those things. Um, the second uh, institution that's going to be crucial for this is education, the institution that I, uh, I represent. Uh, education has been extremely poor at providing lifelong learning, and we have to change that. I don't think education institutions are going to be able to do that, but what you will see is massive investment in different types of education, particularly based around this real and current investment in uh, online learning, which I don't think has yet delivered, but I absolutely am convinced will deliver and will provide opportunities for people to live right to learn right across their life. The main actual culprit, by the way, in lifelong learning and lifelong working is corporations. And there is a great deal of evidence that corporations are completely ageist when it comes to older workers. And by older, by the way, I mean people who are over 55. Now, I was 55 10 years ago, so I can tell you that that feels pretty young. There are awful studies. There are studies which show uh, completely the level of ages. And, and I speak as a woman, and I've said this publicly before, that I believe that ageism is worse than any gender discrimination that we've seen. And it has to be addressed. And corporations are very slow to address it. And I think, and this is my final point, I think you will see government stepping in uh, to regulate and to support uh, people both to work longer, to encourage them to work longer, and to encourage corporations to take a different view about what it is to be 55, uh, what it is to be 65, and so on. Just to finish, if you live to, to 100, you are working into your 80s, not 70s, 80s. And that's what all of us need to start thinking about. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. So lots of food for thought there. I think uh, um, I was going to say I'm more optimistic, although some of you might think the idea of working into your 80s is, is, is a dystopian future, but anyway, we can come on to that, I'm sure, in the discussion. Um, so next, uh, we're going to move on to the topic of the future of mobility, and I'm really delighted to welcome Tom Wells. He is from the uh, Government Office for Science. Uh, Tom was very instrumental in the uh, early work on the future of ageing um, and was very helpful to our work as we set up the Centre for Ageing Better, so it's great to welcome Tom. Thanks again. Thank you. I'm going to stand up here so I can yes. take through the slides. It's all right. You're fine, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Anne said, my job is to help other bits of government think strategically about the future. We recently published a report following the, the ageing work we did a couple of years ago on the future of mobility. So I'm going to try and draw some lessons from both of those projects today. Um, before I get into that, um, I'll just give you a bit of an introduction to how I think about the future uh, and what that means for mobility. Um, mobility technologies can shape our lives, and most obviously where we go uh, and how fast. Um, they can also shape our aspirations as the motor car demonstrated throughout the 20th century. And they can shape where we live. And you can see that in the, the railway towns around Britain, um, new technology completely reshape places that we thought we wanted to live. But while technology can change rapidly, and often does, people sometimes don't. Uh, so the behaviors of people using this technology don't necessarily change at the same pace. And the infrastructure which technologies are based on and sit upon often can't change that quickly. So there are some tensions within the, the different timelines. Most of the Britain that I hope to grow in, old in, has already been built. Um, so it's worth thinking about technologies in the context of people and infrastructure, not just the technologies that we bring. So how might the change in mobility technologies affect how we as a group age? Two complications before I get into my two scenarios. One is that the future is uncertain, so it makes sense to think about multiple possible futures. Um, but scenarios are always a fiction. The future is more complex than good or bad. There is always evidence of both. Uh, and there are lots of unanticipated things. Um, second, 
the future isn't something that's sat out there over the horizon. As Anna said, the choices we make now as individuals, as communities, as governments, shape the future. Uh, and we'll shape that with the choices that we make. And the futures that we tell ourselves, and the, the, the stories we tell ourselves now, help us think about the different choices we can make and the trade-offs between those. Linda Hines highlighted the role of personal agency. Um, and for that reason, um, I'm really pleased we went in this order. Um, I'm going to tell my uh, scenarios from my own perspective, two ways that I might age. Um, I've been lucky, I've had a good education, I've got a good job. Um, and I'm an optimist, so that probably means that my dystopia is a little bit more optimistic than you might like. Um, what I'm going to try and do is highlight some of the choices that I've made, and uh, what I might make, and what they mean. So, moving on. Scenario one. My wife and I moved here last year. It's 2040. Um, it's a beautiful patch of West Somerset, and I've always wanted to spend some time. We feel pretty young here. Um, <laughs> uh, around 875 people of state pension age uh, live alongside a thousand people of their working, of their working age neighbours. So we feel pretty young. Um, we're very happy with our choice. Technology, things like virtual reality and remote working have moved to the point where I can stay in my government job, I'm really enjoying it. But the difference is I can get out to the hills. Uh, I can walk out to Exmoor after work, go to a lovely garden. And my lifestyle is completely different to what I was expecting uh, to, to have in, in London for, for the majority of my career. So we are actually engaged well into our 60s. We're feeling confident about the kind of multi-stage life that we, we've been thinking about ever since we read Linda's book in our 30s. Um, <coughs> we know our neighbours down the road, uh, to knock at at least as we drive past. But that's fine because actually between social media and virtual reality and we came to visit, our lives in London really weren't left behind at all. The same friends and family, same interests, still watch the same plays in the National Theatre. Um, and as I said, the quality of life we've got there is brilliant. Why didn't we do this in our 40s? Gradually, my knees start to pack in. They've always been bad and I know that's coming. Um, and we live quite a long way from the shops, so the walks get shorter. We rely more heavily on drone deliveries, and we rely on the car for everything else. And one day, sure enough, my wife has to stop driving. Um, I gave up years ago because it never made sense in London anyway. Um, the kids wonder, well, why haven't we got an autonomous car? They had one for a while. Surely that would make sense. We wouldn't lose our independence. I remember my parents talking about that moment of loss of car and, and feeling that quite, quite painfully. Unfortunately, they've only just been able to deal with narrow rural roads without lines in the middle. Um, and the latest models that can do that, there's no way that I can afford them. I did take a test drive, but my sense was actually there were some for young people. It was incredibly difficult to get into an out of. Um, they talk about shared ownership in, in, in where my kids live. Uh, I'm not convinced that's right to me. I don't trust it. Ever since my 30s, I've been much more aware of that my data, and I don't really want the company tracking where I'm going. So the calls that I have with my friends have probably taken on an extra significance, but as the technology improves, it's meant to get more realistic and more rewarding, and that's not been my experience. The data pipes through uh, still with my old fiber optic cables, uh, just doesn't really keep up. Uh, and I'm finding more and more what I really want to do is see the old person. Um, I think we move on a little bit more. We need a little bit of home, uh, help at home. Uh, I'm expecting, given my pension is pretty good, um, I'm expecting that to be able to afford that. I'm really surprised by the quote that comes in from, from the Domestory Care Agency. They explain the struggle to recruit staff in that area. There's not very many people around of working age, and many people leave. More importantly, there are such long distances between their visits, they spend most of their time driving. Uh, and so that's the cost of kept high. They do offer a remote support package. Um, I like that. I'm kind of used to that with the doctors, and since we gave up driving, that's been a great, great help. But for some of these things, I just need somebody in the house. I'm not sure that's going to work. Same story when you talk to the taxi companies and the buses. Too long, too many distances between fares. They can't make it work. Stuck in my beautiful cottage that sometimes I struggle to even leave. Those paths are pretty narrow, the steps aren't working. I'm wondering whether this isn't quite the utopia we planned. 
okay. Um, scenario two. So uh, we moved here last year, 2014. Uh, we feel pretty old here. Um, 283 people of working age live alongside, uh, uh, over 75 age live alongside 1,000 working age neighbors. Um, we lived here our whole life's employment. Um, so we are surrounded by friends and family. We know people. Uh, we gave up the car years ago. Uh, since the first smartphones, it was really easy to plan journeys. But the real difference came when autonomous vehicles stepped in to fill those gaps between little bits of public transport. And suddenly the car felt redundant. Um, I particularly like the little buses. Um, they are a real godsend in terms of social life. They're so small, and there's so many routes, but it's more affordable, that actually everybody on there is familiar. Pretty much everybody in my, everybody in my bus lives in my building. And I have a nice chat with the, the young dad down the road on the way to the shops. Um, it took a little while longer for these to roll out in rural areas, but even friends in the village that I grew up are raving about these now. They can get around. And actually, as I start to lose a little bit of my mobility, I still think I can get around. I do wonder about the data that people are collecting on, the, on these platforms, but actually, the app that I use discounts my tickets automatically and aggregates my journeys, and I feel like I'm getting something out of it. So um, I basically accept that. My online interactions have got more developed as the technology has improved, and Corium is always one of the first areas of the country to get an upgrade in data. Uh, so they feel enriching. Um, I'm keeping in touch with people across the world. Um, but they're not the only social interactions I have. So I feel like they add to my experience, not the only one. I do complain about Corium being busy. Um, it's always been busy. But actually, if I'm honest, the fact that all the things that I need are around me makes it much easier to stay active and build being active into my daily life. We were on for a few years. I'm talking to the nice young man who provides uh, most of my home care. How does he have so much time to chat? Um, such a far cry experience of what my grand described from her experience of home care. Everyone who's too busy is just about pushing his own. He explains to me a lot of things have changed since the 20s waving at the robot who went <laughs> But the big one is that he can do the paperwork that he's required to in the back of his tub. I secretly wonder whether he's ever touched a piece of paper that I get with him. So that leads me to some questions about what we might want to think about. Um, and we talked about agency at the start. Um, you can read them in order, and I think the ones at the top have got a lot more control over. I'm lucky but I think I will have a choice about that. Where do I choose to travel? Is that somewhere I've got social capital? Is it somewhere that's easy to provide transport and mobility services to? Or is it somewhere that that's much harder? How do I use my digital mobility? There's no question that that is I mean, it's being revolutionized all the time. At the time we're in 2040, it will be unrecognizable from today. How are we using that? Is it to augment our social connectivity? Is it to augment our in-person interactions? Or is it become the only thing Um, do I build activity and resilience into my transport choices? So am I thinking about resilience from that perspective, or do I rely on a single mode which I'm going to lose at some point? Um, I can't control how the technology rolls out. I can't control what I choose to commission for myself. I think there's a real question about how we think about data uh, for public goods, and this maybe isn't just limited to transport, but if you look at many of the kind of things coming through in the mobility space, Data is absolutely key to delivering those. Do we retain trust in that system in a way that we can engage with those systems? What's the net model for that? I think that's a, that's a big question. Um, and I think there is a question about autonomy. And a joke, well, was I going to talk about autonomous cars? And I, I did. Um, but it's a, the real question is not just do we get autonomous cars? Of course we will. Um, how fast and what model do we expect it to come out? Is it uh, we all own an autonomous vehicle? sits on a drive otherwise, or is it a shared ownership model? And they're very different in terms of how you access them and of their impact on the system. And importantly, how inclusive are they? How are they designed? Are they something that I look at in my cities and think, oh, or, or actually do I think, is it, is it for, for the focus of cars? <coughs> so some choices for us to make. Great. Thank you, Tom. Very good segue because Tom's not only uh, talked about sort of 
transport, but obviously there are much wider issues about where we live and mobility. So I'm delighted now to introduce our next panellist, uh, who will uh, hopefully be talking about the future of housing. Uh, Rose Gilroy uh, is Professor of Ageing, Policy and Planning at Newcastle University. And I was very excited to be up in Newcastle earlier this week, seeing a uh, new uh, city centre development on which the National Innovation Centre for Ageing is based in a new uh, building called the Helix. Alongside that, there's going to be a new housing development, which I know Rose is very involved in shaping. So delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. If we're thinking about housing health, we don't have to you know, sit down and be terribly imaginative or think anything you know, desperately new because I think we're already wading in housing hell. Our new build rate is far too low and our housing is getting smaller. The tragedy is that we don't realise it's getting smaller. Why is it you can go to countries as diverse as the United States, China and India and people will tell you they live in X square metres or Y square feet? You ask a British person what they live in, three bedrooms and a bathroom. I mean, you know, we don't know how big our housing is. So we don't realise that the builders are giving us considerably less for considerably more money. And, you know, some of these things are just so simple. They think, why aren't we having them? Why aren't we demanding more? If we think about the five basic accessible features, and we all know what they are, having no steps up to your front door, having a level threshold, having a lavatory at entrance level, having wide enough doorways so you don't have to do some elaborate three-point turn if you're working with, walking with a stick, having <coughs> circulation space. The percentage of our housing which has this is woeful, and it's not getting any better. Um, and if we look at most older people now, our home owners, 76%. What has this obsession with home ownership delivered to us? We used to have this idea that home ownership meant that people were well off. Well, if you look at home ownership across the deciles, everybody is represented. And 67% of older people who live in poverty are owner-occupied. We've always had an issue of people who are asset rich and income poor, of which the older group were the majority of them. But the right to buy generation have retired now. Those people who I worked in housing when the right to buy came in. Typical buyer was a man who was a bus driver and his wife worked part time in a department store. Those people haven't retired on a shed load of money. They haven't got the money to invest in their housing. We've got growing issues of disrepair. They haven't got the money to keep their energy systems um, working or to invest in new technologies. And yes, central government has invested in this. We've had more money into disabled facilities grant, which is fabulous, but it pales into insignificance for the support given the first time by it. So we know where the political priorities are. And our final speaker will tell us the problems of housing rock up at the door of a hospital. The spending on in the NHS because of poor housing is more than a billion pounds a year. Ouch. We keep talking about the pressures in the health service. We don't need more hospitals, but we do need more hospitals, more doctors, more of this. But we actually need better housing. So let's think about we can wade further into this housing hell. It can get a whole lot worse. There's been some research recently which suggests that the younger, older person, I'm talking about the 50 to 54, I'm 64, so 50 to 54 seems remarkably young and yes. So if this is going on, if more people are thinking that they might move, well, is that probably quite good? But where actually are they going to move to? What are people building? Is it affordable? Is it accessible? Is it where people want to live? And you know, picking up on something the first speaker said, which I'm passionately uh, in favor of, can we get our builders away from this entrenched view of the life course? We come in three groups for them. We are the young professionals who want apartments in branded developments <coughs> in the city centre or close to public transit. Or then we leap into coupledom and young kids, in which case we want a terrace or a semi-D with a bit of a garden for the kids. And then we leap into something which looks 
remarkably institutional and because the idea of an old life is a small life you give people a wee amount of space and one of those call along pendants around the neck oh dear oh dear you know you know frail old soul i mean is this what you want and everybody's thinking about what um why can't we focus on what binds us together we all want affordable accessible adaptable and beautiful Something beautiful is not extraneous in our life. It's not a frippery. I think it's a common human need. I started my working life a very long time ago in Newcastle City Housing, writing briefs for sheltered housing. I am now very firmly the, in the view that we should not be putting our eggs in age-targeted housing. What is so special about chronology? You know, what is it that if you're 65, you're going to automatically get on with everybody who's in their 60s and 70s? <laughs> you're going to be, you know, if you've been lonely and isolated, suddenly you're going to have this new social life. If you talk to people who've lived in sheltered housing, isn't that a wonderfully patronizing term? What are we um, sheltering people from? Life? Um, People can find a new social life, and it can be wonderful, but other people can be painfully lonely, more lonely than they were before. This is not the answer. For goodness sake, let's try and do something better. So, housing heaven, again, you know, it's in our hands now. Three years ago this month, I got to what I playfully called a Nervous Presley moment where I thought, what I need is a little less conversation, a little more action. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, right, so I brought together a diverse group of people from the local authority, from university, from business, from the third and community sector to help us think about different housing. And with a fair win through planning, later this year we'll be building 53 new dwellings on the Helix development. They're going to be one and two bed apartments, two and four bed housing. This is not housing for old people. It's housing in which you can live your life with adaptable walls. Housing which is a fabric first approach to energy, which takes in renewables, which is informed by um, technology but I take absolutely the point of the previous speaker we need to have a grown-up and informed conversation about who owns our data and the whole ethics of data but you know let's be honest most people don't get the privilege of living in new builds so the other part of housing future is we need to invest considerably more in the stock that we have Theresa May, among the other things which are on our mind at the moment, has talked about <laughs> delivering five years of extra health. Oh, that's an ambitious agenda. But you can actually do it pretty soon by investing more in our housing. Just because people are owners, I don't think it means that they have to shoulder the whole burden of keeping their housing in decent repay. Because poor housing is not a private matter. It's an issue for society. It is no good for us as a nation if our housing is falling to pieces. And that housing problem causes us problems in the health service. <coughs> and I just want to end. These are words from Sarah Wigglesworth, um, a colleague at um, Sheffield. She did a project a couple of years ago called Dwell and came out with a set of principles which are not rocket science, <coughs> but you think, yes, that's what we want. A home that continues to allow people to pursue the pleasures of life today while feeling secure that their home can adapt to their future needs. Isn't that a housing heaven? Why can't it be a housing present? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rose. And uh, in a sense, throwing down a challenge to our, our next speaker, um, uh, Neil Dixon, who is Chief Executive of the NHS Confederation and previously was also Chief Executive at the General Medical Council and also here at the King's Fund. And like me, this is a bit of a homecoming back to uh, the King's Fund to talk to us about how, in a way, health and social care in the future is going to be able to respond to some of these challenges that the other speakers have uh, laid out. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Anna. And uh, thank you very much for 
asking me. I, was, I think the Prime Minister has been mentioned twice, I wonder why, uh, in, in the course of uh, the presentation so far. And I want to take you to number 10, an imaginary number 10 just now, where the Prime Minister is sitting at the uh, Cabinet table, a few things probably on our mind. Uh, but in walks the Cabinet Secretary and hands over uh, a brown envelope um, with top secret marked on it. And she opens it up and there is a short briefing document there which reveals that at a laboratory in Leicester, they have um, invented a pill which can extend human life at very low cost to 200 to 250 years. <laughs> um, and I, 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 there was a debate I took part in uh, a few years ago on you know, extending life. And I have to say, by the end of it, I'd switch sides, although I was speaking on one side. But because I was the optimist saying this was all great, and, and by the end of it, actually, if you think of all the, think of all the implications uh, for um, society of, of, uh, of that. Um, certainly, li living uh, with no decline in either mental or physical capacity obviously has, a, has an enormous amount of uh, appeal. And this is all quite intellectually interesting, but I think uh, while looking at uh, utopia, dystopia is helpful, you can go too far in terms of uh, what, what is a route to practical, practical policy. There's one other dimension I want to just touch on before I move on to health and care, which has been touched on. I think there has been um, another dimension around ageing in the sense that in recent years, I think the tension between different generations has resurfaced in a way that it, it, it used to happen some years ago, but ha seems to have uh, come back. I think this is, in many ways, a debate in the a public sphere and less in the private one. So if you were to ask uh, most children and grandchildren and so on who the most important people of their lives were and who they trusted most, it actually tends to be their parents and grandparents. Uh, so there isn't a, a complete fracturing. But there, there certainly is tension, and in my utopia, certainly, we would, we would uh, certainly see the ageism which was touched on earlier tackled, and we would have generational respect and harmony. In the health and care world, we did a study here at the King's Fund when I was uh, here, which began to look at the future of social care funding, um, which uh, the government of the day in uh, 2007 said great and they almost entirely accepted all our recommendations in private and said they were going to pr proceed with this and then a small thing happened with a few banks uh, and that was the end of the story and ironically now in social care and i'll come back to this we are uh, in a worse position now than uh, in that report the, the the key new bit of information i think which came in that report which was not much noticed but it absolutely challenged a, a view which uh, was quite strong, certainly in a lot of uh, European studies up until that point, was that the tale of morbidity, the, the, the period of time in which individuals would, would have relatively unhealthy periods of their life was actually extending. So while we were getting more healthy years, we were also getting more unhealthy healthy years. And that challenge, I think, still lies at the heart of uh, uh, moving from a dystopian to a utopian uh, world. So if I look at my uh, utopian world, I think I, I would have three ambitions for the health and care system. The first is around access. Access, the, the word of new labor, it was the thing that when they, uh, they came to power, they said was the thing that most worried the public. And we got all the work which reduced health times from 18 months to 18 weeks, which four hours in A&E and, and all, all the rest of it. Uh, but the reality is that at this moment, we have very serious problems around access. I shall come back. Secondly, um, we want safe and effective health and care services. And again, I think we have, a, we have a situation at the moment where we're certainly not in utopia in relation to that area. And thirdly, and crucially, we want to have a, a, a health and care system which provides the right care and treatment, uh, which will create a sustainable system uh, going forward. Let me just begin by um, access. Uh, and, a, and a bit like housing, actually, you don't need to describe it as the future, you just describe where we're, where we're at at the moment. The reality is that there are um, the people of all ages, uh, but particularly elderly people, who can't see a, a health professional 
uh, when when they need one, whether that's uh, sitting in a an NA, an A and E uh, corridor or not getting access to see their their GP or any health professional at their surgery. Uh, there there are certainly people who can't get a hospital a hospital bed. There are people with urgent mental health problems who are not getting of all ages who are not getting access to <coughs> treatment. There are ironically very large numbers of people who are in hospital who can't get out of hospital uh, because of the absence of social and community uh, care. Um, and if you look at the whole social care story, there are something like 4.4 million older people in England who are not uh, having their social care needs met, much worse than it was in 2007 when that report was written and we said social care was in a state of uh, a state of crisis. You, you endlessly redefine your dystopia or you redefine what it means uh, to, be in, to be in crisis. So uh, the question then is in terms of um, wh what do we uh, do about uh, access? And I'll come back to that when I've produced some solutions to this. Uh, secondly, around safe and effective. Um, the reality is that in our health and our care system, and this is not confined to this country, but we are still working on what is essentially a 20th century model of how we provide care. It's episodic, it sees us as individuals rather than being part of uh, an ecosystem or part of a community. It intervenes when things go badly wrong rather than intervening early in order to prevent us uh, getting to, to that point. Uh, the levels of iatrogenic uh, uh, deaths are frightening if you look at that. So the healthcare system, uh, it's been estimated, I think the Institute of Medicine in the States, and this is not just a criticism of the States, I think it applies to health and care systems uh, around the world, but was in 2013, 284,000 deaths were caused by iatrogenic, uh, uh, iatrogenic illness, in other words, by mistakes or harm that was caused by the uh, healthcare system. So we, we have a real challenge if we, the dystopian world is where the health and care system continues to cause huge amounts of, of harm. And then my third point about right care at the right time. We, we do face a burning platform because, frankly, if we go on with our current structure of healthcare system, it is unsustainable. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You can actually get more and more money from the government, but we will continue simply to fund a system which cannot, which cannot be sustained. And that, in a way, makes me the optimist, that means, because we have to find a solution now. I was reflecting with Anna earlier, when we were at the fund, that there was a lot of work done, and actually it would be interesting just to lift out of those documents and compare them with the current uh, objectives uh, for, the, uh, for the NHS. But they're pretty well the same, which is we haven't got the balance right, we seem to be putting large amounts of money into the acute sector, we're not putting enough money into community services, we haven't reorganised community services in the federal. we need to do something about it. And here we are, uh, up to 20 years on, and we're still saying exactly the same thing. Uh, I think the argument has to be, it is unsustainable. We can't go on doing this because we haven't got the funds, and even if you did have the funds, and you had the people, which we don't have those either, uh, we, we, we would not be able to uh, solve, the, solve the problem. Um, the, the, the key to this, coming back to the tale of mobility, is the rise of comorbidity. So this, what, what is the system dealing with? It's dealing with very large numbers of people. And remember, prevention, great, and we absolutely need to focus on that. But prevention does not stop the, um, the heart disease that's beating in this room at the moment. Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, prevention in, in its primary form. So there's both primary and secondary prevention. We need to find ways of supporting people who are living with illnesses like cancer, which used to be killers and are now long-term illnesses. But there are a range of those. And we need to find a model of care which provides support for <coughs> those individuals and doesn't just allow them then to deteriorate and find themselves yo-yoing in, in, in and out of hospital. So dealing with that issue of the extended care uh, of uh, morbidity. So what are the solutions to this? And I think uh, I, I, most of this will be familiar, I guess, to most of you. But first of all, this, this question of, of funding. And we do really need to deal with the question of funding. And, and this is about how as a society and what we want to put into health and care services. There is no doubt that if you look since 1948, 
start with the health service, but in countries around the world, countries as they have grown richer have chosen to put more into their health care. And that, that rise has continued uh, um, uh, fairly inexorably. We've had the most difficult period over the last um, 10 years or so <coughs> in, in terms of the lack of funding going into our system, and that has caused some of those dystopian features that I've, that I've uh, referred to. But we need to get that right. We did a report at the Confederation we commissioned the IFS, the Institute of Fiscal Studies and the Health Foundation. The estimate there was that we would need to put in 4% a year, every year, in real terms into healthcare to even begin the question of the transformation which I've described to a new kind of system. Now, the government announced 2.4%, which is massively higher uh, than any other bit of the public sector, first of all, and secondly, a lot higher than we've been used to. But that 3.4% is, uh, in reality, not 3.4%, because, of course, never buy a used car from the Treasury. They, they, the 3.4% actually describes one bit of the NHS budget, not the whole of it. So excluded capital expenditure, public health, um, and, uh, and training. And crucially, it excluded social care. Social care is the neglected sister of these two services. Um, and I absolutely don't want to underestimate the impact that housing and education and some of those other things can also have on health. Social care, however, has been fundamentally underfunded, not just since 2007, but before, but by, uh, but by, successive, uh, by successive governments. Second area is uh, safe care. And, it, and I think there's an awful lot of, that we in the health and care system need to do around standardizing procedures. We have the opportunity through data to actually segment populations and ironically provide much more individualized and tailorized uh, care and support than we've been able, able to do. This isn't, I don't think, about robots walking down the street, but it certainly is about being able to identify people with particular conditions and particular uh, needs and circumstances and providing much more tailored uh, support to that and being able to monitor uh, individuals and to give individuals much greater control over their own health and care, particularly when they have long-term conditions. And lastly, right care at the right time. Um, we. We absolutely need to embrace these new models of care. We've talked about this stuff endlessly. It is extremely difficult to do when you're trying to deal with a, an accident and emergency department that has literally queues coming out the door. And how do, you, how do you move from that situation to a new model of care where you're starting to invest in new kind of um, uh, care in the community? There's, there is evidence, both from this country and around the world, that new models of care can start to reduce demand that you can start to provide interventions for people in the community in a way that will prevent that dystopian future where not only have we got uh, acts and emergency departments falling over, but whole hospitals that simply cannot cope. And, and we're not so far away from that. There is, there is huge pressure on that system uh, at the moment. So we have to move to that. If you look at somewhere like Staten Island, where they've acted, an American system, where they've actually joined up all the bits of care, identified the fact that huge numbers of elderly people were coming from well, nursing and residential homes into hospitals. Why? Because the staff, and we so basic, the staff didn't know how to set up an IV for it. Uh, so that anybody who was in the, in the least bit dehydrated or whatever, they would send them into, into hospital. Joining up these services, bringing people out of the hospitals and creating new form of joined up services in the community has to be uh, the future going forward. You can see the same thing, Kaiser Permanente is another American example, but there are from the vanguards that the NHS experimented with, there are real beginnings of real evidence that we can change it, but we do have to develop these new services in the community. And if we don't do that, then we will have a dystopian future. If we do do it, we won't have a utopian future, but we certainly will have a system which can support an elderly population much more effectively than we're able to do now. Great. Well, what a stimulating uh, set of uh, remarks. And we've got um, a good amount of time now for discussion and debate. So I'm going to put you all on notice for getting your hands ready to go up for uh, questions. And we'll also um, see uh, whether we can take some of the questions that we've been having coming in remotely. But um, I thought I might uh, just kick off with the first question. It was a theme that came up in a number of the... Uh, speakers' uh, comments, which was really around 
uh, technology and data. So there's a lot of um, you know excitement, whether it's about smart homes, about AI in healthcare. Tom, you know, you talked about the sort of uh, possibilities, um, you know, the amount of data that is uh, driving a driverless car. Um, and, you know, you, you talked perhaps less about it. I mentioned about the sort of, uh, you know, the changes in the workplace uh, as a result of technology. Um, how do we ensure that this is for the, for the good, uh, for the wider good and the public good, and in particular, that it doesn't sort of further deepen the exclusion um, that we sometimes see now, whether that's digital exclusion or uh, people just not having access to these technologies. Um, Linda, any thoughts about sort of um, the, the impact of technology, AI and data on the future of work? Well, I know a great deal about it with regard to the future of work, but not so much. <coughs> I, I'm sort of struggling to, to link that into aging, but, but I'm probably just not making that connection. I'm going to hand it straight over to Tom. <laughs> so I think, for me, it's about what, what's the right model for, for this for data, whatever it is, to, to be released mm -hmm. and for the value of that to be realized. Um, it's, it's not trivial, but the, regardless of what the data is. I think we are becoming a citizen much more aware of the value of it. Um, if it's just handed over and I see no benefit of that, is that a sustainable model for kind of whatever the data is? Or do we need to have some kind of stake as citizens in that in some way? Um, I think kind of there are some really kind of good examples of things, and I think you see some of the work that people like um, the 100,000 Genomes Project have done with their, their kind of panel of, of, kind of uh, people taking part. And there's kind of real, kind of really kind of powerful engagement by them. Uh, I think models like that may be a, a kind of good example. Um, but, it, but what we need to find is something that works for the citizen, but also the people that are the experts at exploiting that data. And often, yeah, they can be companies or, or, or it's the NHS. Um, and do you think those attitudes and fears are different amongst sort of you know older generations? I mean, do you think that the, the sort of technological developments will leave groups behind? So there's a cohort effect in most technologies. Uh, often it's younger people that kind of uh, kind of take on a new technology first. When it comes to actually suspicion around data, I'm not actually sure. Um, and actually, I think because some of my kind of younger colleagues are the ones who are most aware, uh, actually, of, of the value of some of the, the data that they I probably gave away in my 20s without really thinking about. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't think there's any data that shows generation differences on awareness, but there is clear data that countries with an aging population invest more in technology. I mean, but that's data is now, now coming out. So for example, Japan, which is a country I know well, um, is one of the major investors in technology. And, and part of that is because they see technology as a, as a really important part of supporting an aging population. Because one thing to remember, and it's, it's sort of, you know, we talk a lot about individuals aging, but actually the more fundamental issue is societies are aging. So in Japan, for example, the average person is going is now in their forties and that will increase the average person. And China will age faster than Japan does. So the sort of demographic transition that you see Japan has, has gone through is slower mm. than the demographic transition that, that, that countries like mm. India and, Japan, and China will go, go through. So it isn't just that there are aging, there are older people in a society. It's just, it's also the whole society becomes older. And when that happens, you get higher investment rates in technology. And I certainly know in Japan, the shortage of care workers has meant, particularly in the care sector, mm -hmm. a big investment in trying to <laughs> identify substitutable robotics. Although I think that the success of that has been somewhat limited to date, and they're still trying to recruit what? Uh, yeah. care workers to come yeah. in. But, um, well, Japanese people in general are much more comfortable with use interacting with robots and with uh, AI uh, machines than we are, simply because if you look at Japanese um, children's, uh, and, and by that I mean people of my age, they would have grown up with sort of robotic, in, in their playbooks they had robotic friends. Uh, and that's always been part of the manga tradition in Japan. So there's a lot more comfort, comfort with dealing with both robots, which uh, Japan has the highest level of robots in the world, mm -hmm. or the South, the South, the South Korea, but, and indeed with machine learning. Mm -hmm. 
So, Rose, these new homes, are they going to be sort of full of technology? How is technology going to transform the way we live in uh, old age? I think one of, well, one of the things we're committed to is data monitoring of environmental issues, so it would be things like air quality, energy usage, etc. We're proceeding much more cautiously in respect of the Internet of Things and things which are, what would you call them, a soft surveillance? Can we find that language about this? Because I think at the moment, the, um, the creation of kind of bright, shiny <coughs> gadgetry is run on massively. And it's very easy to get kind of thinking, wow, I'm going to have that and that because it's bright and shiny and exciting. Um, but I think we need to have a big pause and have a conversation that we're, we're planning this in Newcastle where we can almost co-design some ethics, some security between citizens, commissioners and makers. Because I think for makers as well, there's an appetite for considering this more broadly. If you can inspire greater trust in a person who's going to commission technology or someone who's going to be the user of that technology, then actually you've broken down some powerful barriers, I think, to adoption. Um, well, uh, the, the first thing to say uh, is, is in the health and care space, so um, I think the first point to make is generally we're, we're not terribly good at predicting some of this <laughs> stuff. Um, and, and when the internet came on, I don't think many of us saw some of the downsides, very significant downsides that we, we have seen. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, we're pretty bad at predicting the upsides as well. So I remember visiting Nigeria in the early 90s and going to a, a hotel which had been built just at the time of independence, which had very smart phones in it. But of course, they weren't connected to anything, so there was, there was no, there was no infrastructure, uh, and the the Nitel phone system was, you know, you queued for half an hour before you think. Um, that's just been completely blown away because they they haven't needed to create a phone structure; they've just bunged up some masks, and and mobile technology has completely uh, transformed that. So I think, you know, it's uh, our our one is. The, what was it Microsoft said, the future's already with us. So we need to look at what's already around and, and, and probably work on that. And also recognize that we won't be able to predict some of the things which may actually be the most significant uh, going forward. In, in health terms, for me, as I look now, is one data, I mentioned that, the power of data to enable us to provide better support, care, and treatment for individuals, which is targeted at them. Secondly, the ability to monitor you know, your own body and whatever, well, here's the Fitbit, but uh, this is dead primitive stuff compared with what's coming down the line. And of course, the Prime Minister, back to her, has already got something in her arm. Um, uh, so I think a lot of that is going to happen. I think uh, it will also allow more personalized care, so that, that what I get is much more suited to what I think. And, and lastly and importantly, I think there's going to be a growth of individual, ironically, and I hope this is right, individual control over their own health. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually this could be really empowering uh, mm -hmm. for, for individuals going forward. Okay, we've got a lot of optimists on the panel. I don't know uh, whether the audience, whether you're as optimistic, but we'll probably soon find out as we take some of your uh, questions and comments. So if you can just raise your hand. I think we do have, do we have roaming mics to come round? So um, if you wait for a mic to come and then just uh, say your name, that'd be great. So we'll start here. Um, oh, we'll start the front, but we'll start that, yep. Yeah. Hi, it's a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, it sounds to me that we should, should be getting... Just introduce yourself, sorry. Um, Ian Mislin. It sounds to me that we should be getting Amazon in on this conversation um, with respect to um, their use of technology um, because there's obviously been quite a lot in the, in the press recently about people's anxiety about um, giving away data and obviously they're, they're obviously and they're collecting data which we probably don't know about um, but considering this guy is the wealthiest man in the world um, maybe he can he can actually um, channel some of the money that Amazon are getting into funding um, healthy aging okay um, bring the microphone to the front here. Um, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Uh, Rachel Loy from Message House. Um, I wanted to ask about the language around ageing and longevity. Mm. Um, I really, it was 
struck by Rosie's comment about sheltered housing. Mm -hmm. And we've got research shows that, I mean, with the three-stage life ending, you know, everything from the word retired, which doesn't mean retired anymore, to student, to senior. I mean, the, yeah. the, the challenge yeah. of the kind of embedded assumptions mm -hmm. that go yeah. with a lot of these words that we all have. Yeah. So with your kind of futures hat on, in terms of multiple possible futures, um, do we need to reclaim these words, or do we need new words? And what are the panel's thoughts on how we can have a kind of better language for longevity going forward? Okay, great. So we're going to uh, take uh, one more. Come down the front here. <coughs> I'll take this bunch of three, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, thank you to the panel for um, their comments and presentations. Um, I'm Rekha Elasvarapu. I'm an associate fellow with the International Longevity Centre. Um, <coughs> I have a two-part question. The first part is something that we always hear in health and social care is the biggest problem of integration mm -hmm. is that health is free at the point of delivery as social care isn't. Mm -hmm. So either we make health um, paid or we make social care free. Mm -hmm. And that's a political hot potato and it's been going on forever. Um, but following on from that, integration is important, whether it is about health and social care or whether it is with housing and mobility and everything. And something that has been talked about before, do we need a minister for older people who will bring all this together? And what does panel think about okay, that? Right, so quite a range of different uh, uh, points there. So this one about language and um, ages, and who wants to pick, uh, start with that? Um, oh, I'll jump in on this. I think it's a fascinating issue, and I must admit I haven't got any terribly bright ideas. Maybe this is something for the Centre for Aging Better. Maybe have some competition, but you know, I think an older person, you can be an older person now at 55 and you think, if you're going to live to 100, this is bonkers, isn't it? So half your life you're described as an older person, and you think, oh, we really need to be thinking, have some just better language, because most of it comes from this Bismarck idea. You're in education, you're raising kids, and then you're growing geraniums or donning socks or something. <laughs> Life doesn't look like that anymore. So we need we need a much more inclusive language to, to think about that. But I think we also need to get away <coughs> from this notion that chronology is deeply meaningful. It is one facet of who you are. Just because I'm 64 mean you think, well, so what? Because as we know, maths is overrated. What does it matter? <laughs> So let's try and flex that open, but have a comp not just about the language, but about the ideas that we have associated with this life stage and what these numbers are meant to mean. So Lindsay, you said something quite strong about ageism, almost uh -huh. um, you know, being one of the uh, equality um, and uh, characteristics that are effectively sort of probably most overlooked. What do you think needs to change in the workplace? Oh, in the world, well, can I just make a note? I, I mean, I so agree with Rose, and, and, and I just wanted to say a couple of things about that, and I'll talk very briefly about the workplace. One of the things that Singapore, you know, and you always end up talking about Singapore whenever you <laughs> um, but it is only an island, remember, and it's got a very small number of people. As, uh, but actually, one of the things they've done is go through every single one of their government policies and got rid of any ageist language. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to know, to, to in, 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 in answer to the question, uh, what substitutes that? I mean, because I write books, I'm very, very sensitive to language, and Andrew Scott and I have really worked really hard on that. But it's there are, it's difficult to come up with new a new set of language, as you suggest. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to do that. The um, the American Association of Retired People, AARP, I'm sure everybody knows that. They're an amazing group, and they've been, they've got th th 300 million, they've got 30 million uh, members. It's the largest largest membership group in the world, actually, and they've been really hitting this. I have a personal bug, which is about generational labels. Mm. I absolutely hate them. There's no research to support them. And any time I ever can, I say, stop labeling people. Mm. You know, Gen Y, Gen X, baby, it's just horrible. Uh, and there's absolutely no, I speak now as an academic, there is no research that supports differences between generations. I mean, it's much more complex than that. Mm. So I think you're absolutely right. Just on the point about institutions, and what should you know? What should governments do? Um, I had a really interesting time last year because uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan started a council on the hundred year life. I was a member of that council, and he put uh, all of the major stakeholders. So that was the ministers, 
the uh, heads of the universities, the uh, retired people associated together for a year to, to talk about that. And they have, they have now, or we have now, the council has now uh, published a whole set of recommendations about that. And by the way, uh, Japan is hosting the G20 mm -hmm. uh, in May, and one of the which I will be at, and one of the issues is on uh, on on uh, older workers. So they're really putting it as the centre of the innovation, as indeed is the UK in Bayes. Bayes has got that as one of the in innovation. Uh, so, so, yeah. But Tom, any sense that companies like Amazon, Google, some of these big players are getting interested in the future of aging and uh, what role, uh, good or bad, could they play? So I think one of the things that's really exciting actually is, is voice. Um, I think it, it may be the first of, of the kind of big interfaces that is uh, almost accessible <coughs> by, by design, kind of right from the word go. And I think it's, I mean, it's been a, a remarkably rapid rollout of a, a kind of voice activated assistance with, with, with a number. Um, what I think them and the kind of the smart home platforms are changing is kind of when, when we used to talk about putting technology and kind of assisted technology in people's homes, you're talking about putting a platform mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. and then somebody using it. And what we might be talking about in the future is putting something that sits on top of a platform that somebody's already got, mm -hmm. which is just commonplace. And I think that finding ways to work with the owners of those platforms mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for us to have our own anymore. Uh, finding ways to work with them so that we can put something on top of those that supports people's well-being and kind of helps people remain, uh, kind of maintain their independence. I think that absolutely has to happen. Um, but it's you know, think about it. You, you wouldn't make sense for the NHS to buy everybody an iPhone to give them a health app. But once everybody's got one, it kind of makes sense for there to be a, a, a cheap app. Um, just to answer the other question on, on the Minister for Aging. Um, it's a personal view now, but I think uh, I think form form follows function. What's absolutely clear, we mentioned it the the industrial strategy grand challenge on, on aging as an example of this, is what's needed is a mechanism to coordinate across government and to kind of have collaboration between different parts of government. Um, there are a number of different ways of doing that. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily say you know, a minister is the right way of, of going about that. I mean, well, first of all, just say on the Minister of Aging question. Uh, uh, you know, the minister, creating ministers generally doesn't work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was it the Minister for Weather? At least, uh, as soon as he, as soon as he or dragged, the minister was appointed and then rain came. But it was rare. <laughs> that, that was rare. I'm saying, uh, but certainly, I, I, I remember going to see a minister in the. It was in the last. Uh, um, it was called the minister for aging. There was a minister for aging, and uh, his, his great theory and idea was creating what I would describe as ghettos for old people. Yeah. You know, I thought, yeah. God, absolutely dreadful. So I'm not sure creating a minister does that. The question about free uh, care, I think, is a really important one and one that mm. we need to debate. There's no question that the current means-tested system for social care in England is completely failing in all sorts of ways. Um, free care would be one answer to that. But of course, as a society, we have to debate how much you want to put into it and, and also how, how, you would, how you would pay for it. I don't believe that uh, that is the only means by which you can get integration. I think that there are other solutions which can bring services together, even if the eligibility uh, the systems are different. But it is a, it's a very legitimate point. Great. So we'll take the mic over the far side, please. Uh, don't <coughs> keep your hand up so they can see you. Thank you. Um, Patrick Wilson, Head of Communications at Health Age International. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear some more optimism from the panel, and <laughs> some more specific optimism around um, so societal and social models of health and care. It was that uh, famous dystopian William Gibson, I think, completed Niall's quote that the future is here now, it's just unevenly distributed. But that's not just about the shiny things, the autonomous vehicles, etc., or Japanese robots. Um, I think there's, there's a huge amount going on in countries in which we're working. Um, for example, in Vietnam, where I was recently looking at intergenerational self help groups um, in low income settings. So it's not just it's not just about, and then I guess the big question is affordability, and particularly 
um, in, in countries which are, are less wealthy, even than our, than our own, and we struggle. Um, positive deviance is, is a word that we often use in development um, to look at, at where things are really working well and why they're working well. Um, and I wondered if, if the panel, apart from Croydon, of course, um, I'm really looking forward to uh, <coughs> Tom in that, that lovely uh, rosy tinted um, <laughs> utopia. But, um, but where, where, where in the world have you seen social based solutions working really well? Okay, great, thank you. So if we can bring the mic round to the middle here. Um, whilst that's happening, I'm gonna um, post, uh, add to this one question, which I think links uh, from um, the Slido. So a question here about the kinds of social infrastructure that's needed for aging well. And so uh, by social infrastructure, the person means the public spaces and the public realm. So we've talked a bit about housing, but a bit more about what is beyond that. So we obviously have the question about sort of social models, but what about the built environment that creates the sort of public spaces in the public realm? Um, so sorry, okay, well, I'll take that one, yeah. Um, I think, sorry, my name is Una Murphy. I'm a coach and facilitator. This isn't really my world, but it's a world I'd like to be part of in terms of making a difference in this area. Um, I, it sort of really echoes what this gentleman said before me around community. The word community has been used a little bit, but I just think it needs to be used an awful lot more. And I feel like there's a lot of people in this room that are interested at the policy level. I'm really interested at the grassroots level. I'm really interested about what your thoughts are, not about the, you know, the shiny technology, but the important thing of human connection Great. and how we make that really happen and allow other people to make it happen for themselves at a community and grassroots level. So I'm really interested in what your thoughts are about that. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we'll take this last um, question here for this group and then Hi, my name is Nina Maradas, and I'm, among other things, a pension trustee. Uh, nobody's mentioned pensions, mm. and if I could just throw in a little damper, um, there's a huge pensions crisis coming upon us as people retiring now generally have some final salary pension, but those are disappearing. People will be retiring with um, no sustainable income, often beyond state pensions which affects everything, it affects transport, it affects housing, it affects all sorts of things. So um, could we have a little money talk? Yeah, um, from the great, panel, please? great. Well, uh, we're, we're feeling like this is one breakfast event is not enough to do justice to all of the themes about the future. So we might have to come back to it, but um, we'll certainly pick it up now if, uh, if people would like to. So um, the ideas there around community, human relationships, social infrastructure, social models, I think it's quite a theme there uh, from a number of questions. And then also the small matter of will we have uh, money to support ourselves in the future uh, into our later life. Um, no, do you want to start this time? OK. Um, so I think the, the, this question of community is a really interesting one. And what do we mean by the term community? I, I think the traditional view about talking about community means a place. Uh, in fact, a community has, that doesn't mean place is not important. And in some places, it's much stronger and it's more effective than it is in other places. So there's something about it, other ways in which you strengthen place and you can make that more effective as a place for human contact. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it would be a mistake not to also recognize that communities mm -hmm. uh, increasingly are formed by all sorts of other things. Uh, there may be people who have an obsession about, I don't know, cats, and they have a, they absolutely have that community of cat lovers, and it is very, very strong. And it's interesting an awful lot of social policy people just ignore this stuff as if it, as if it doesn't happen. That is the reality of how people live their lives, and it could be any topic that you think about and just reflect. You think the other thing is family, and again, family traditionally has been around place as well, and again. Lots of places, that is still true. Lots of people do still live near, but lots don't. So again, how we think about the importance of family and connection, which will still be important in 20 or 30 years time. So the connections between generations and so forth. And, and I entirely accept that there are people who are lonely because they don't have family, or also people who are lonely who do. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's all a wonderful world, but, but how you strengthen that connection and you make sure that people, wherever they're living, 
uh, are, are connected and that connection can sometimes be physical but actually increasingly it will also be uh, through through other other means possible. So I think we need to have a better debate about what community means mm -hmm. and how you support individuals and how we will all relate to each other. And it does link a bit to the public space thing. And and I think, and on the one hand, I absolutely think there's a there's an element of King Canute about saying, well, we'll just preserve our high streets, or we'll preserve our banks, or you know, or dare I say, even our local pharmacy. Uh, and and actually, of course. You know that the waves are washing over this. We need to think the next, mm -hmm. the next phase of what is going to be real and what is going to be helpful and what is going to be supported. Mm -hmm. And I think public space is a really important issue around this. But I don't think that we can preserve the high street <laughs> because actually it's already changing and and it, and it will go. And, and the danger is we just say, oh well, if only we just reinvent the past. We can't. We've got to think of a new future. Yeah. And right. Yes, um, issues of public space, I think this is very important. Um, so I also want to make two remarks um, about, because yes, if we think about how many people have got into technology because of desire to keep in touch with your daughter who's in Melbourne or your grandkids who are in Toronto, Skype is huge now, or FaceTime, anything. This is marvellous. And it's so much better, isn't it, than a phone call. You can look in somebody's face and know them well. It's a qualitative, <coughs> different experience. So I absolutely agree with Neil. We need to have a, um, a richer conversation about, about community and about roles of technology and virtual communities. But if we think about uh, My Future Homes project, we feel very much that we would like to create more than housing. So. I don't think you make community by simply putting people next to each other, but I think you might have a better chance if you give people things to do together. So what we're doing are things like micro allotments and vertical veg, so that even if you're no longer a pers person who can dig, you might be able to say, you know, I wouldn't plant carrots here because the soil is all wrong, you've got an experience to offer to other people. But if we want to have some bright ideas about public space, we can go back to that excellent RIBA publication, which I think might be 2011 or 12, which was called Silver Linings. And that was looking at an aging population and it was thinking, what does this mean, not just for our housing, but the way we use our public space? And they were envisaging, um, I don't know, if you want more play space, but play space for everybody. The pop-up university, where you can go and hear a lecture in a pub, or you know, we know about MOOCs, so you can have those for groups of people, that's online learning stuff. You don't have to do it as an individual. There's all sorts of ways which I think people are already experimenting with. But it's, it's that act of courage, isn't it, thinking, okay, we're not going to invest in shops and try and keep it going, let's do something bold. So it's a bold political decision for an authority to think, right, we'll do it differently. Uh, I wonder if you can make communities. Um, I think they're, they're, they're organic, right? Um, so I, I think a lot of this comes down to creating opportunities for shared experiences. Um, kind of whether that is, um, and, and ideally by design, so whether that's kind of in, in the shared spaces that you create. You know, is, is a car a space where I have uh, time to myself, or is it actually do I get around and is that part of uh, how I spend time with people? Mm -hmm. And in terms of kind of good examples around the world, I mean, often the ones that I think look most exciting are the ones that deal with uh, two challenges and are a bit kind of win win. Um, so, kind of childcare and, and, um, and elder care, and then kind of opportunities in that, or kind of can you find ways that are addressing climate change at the same time as supporting mm -hmm. uh, kind of better late, later mm -hmm. life? I think, some of those kind of win-win examples are some of the, the most exciting for me. Um, quickly on pensions, I, mean, we, I, I kind of think about it not necessarily as a pensions question, and more of a, do we have money enough to have a kind of a good well-being in <coughs> life? And that basically, you know, in this book, it's it's kind of actually where does that money come from? And that's a mix of pensions, savings, actually working, and then having that kind of flexibility. Um, and, and maybe not thinking about it as this kind of monolithic pot that I've mm -hmm. got to get right for the end of my life, uh, or for the end of my working life. Um, but absolutely, it, it, we need to talk about it. We need to make sure of that. And, and just, to, just to finish on the pension question, and also to encourage people to save, um, 
which is very hard to do with low interest rates because you know the magic of compound interest only works if you've got an interest rate. So it's been hard for me to encourage my kids to work to save when actually every year they look at it and it's the same amount of money. So you know that's that's we, I acknowledge that's why I just want to just reinforce a piece about community. It's been very interesting, and I've just this week finished the, the, my next book and. It's been three years we've been talking about Andrew Scott and I. And talking with an economist is really very, very useful for these issues. And we've both come down to exactly the point that, you, that our panel has arrived at, which is about communities and families. Um, but two, two points to make about that. Firstly, communities are already highly polarized, much more than they've ever been before, in terms particularly of wealth. So you, you see in London, wealthy people sit right next to each other, the poor sit right next. So, and in terms of you know things, we, the volunteer activities we do, they're also highly um, polarized. Uh, and the second point to make about families is family structures have changed in a way that I don't think everyone sort of gets it really, which is most women now work. Mm -hmm. And most women now work right the way through their lives. So the family is a different sort of place. Um, institutions are already finding it very difficult by institutions and the corporations to support women to have children, very difficult. The data on that is just getting, not getting any better at all. But in fact, of course, the reality is that for most people, it's looking after older parents that is going to be a more significant time for them than it is looking after their children. And I don't think anyone's even begun to think about that. So we're encouraging corporations to think about giving people time off to care not, it, it doesn't really matter who they're caring for, but just actually time off to care. And, 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 this, and, and then just finally, as I mentioned earlier, intergenerational, it's so important. If there's one thing I would love, it would be to see generations uh, being together. And it really upsets me that London Business School, as I was last week, I'm faced, and some of them are listening on the red panel, so I've talked to you right now, I'm faced with a whole bunch of people who are exactly the same age. Mm -hmm. I find that an incredible lost opportunity. And we've got to stop that. We've mm -hmm. got to create intergenerational education, working, work groups, intergenerational communities, and families where people acknowledge and celebrate the fact there's different ages there. Mm -hmm. So we've only got a, a few more minutes, so I'm actually, rather than coming back to the audience, um, I'm going to take one of the questions that's come in through Slido, because I think we haven't particularly touched on inequalities. You just started, yeah. so I suppose, to... Because as I described the ageing badly and the ageing better, I was very conscious of the fact that there are communities now that look quite like ageing badly that they are very difficult places to age and that the, they're often our poorer communities which um, have you know, little social um, infrastructure um, you know, where the high street has already uh, more or less uh, closed down. So um, you know, the, the, the risk I suppose is that uh, we don't end up either in the utopia or the dystopia but we both end up basically with worse inequalities where some of us live in the world of ageing better and some of us live in the world of ageing badly. So the question that's come in is what is the most important thing that could be done now to ensure that people can age equally in future? So I'll just give the panel a moment to just sort of think about what is the most important thing. So I'm really looking for one thing from each of you that could be done now to ensure people can age more equally in future. So. Um, Thank you uh, to everybody who's come uh, this morning, and I'm sorry that we haven't got to all the fantastic questions uh, that people have submitted. Um, but hopefully, um, as I say, we can probably carry on the conversation online or on Twitter. But um, I'll perhaps start with you, Linda. Okay. My number one thing is that governments provide financial support uh, for people to learn and be educated right through their lives, as indeed Singapore does. The blessed Singapore. Okay. Lifelong learning. Government support for. Tom. I was going to say lifelong learning, and I think it's because um, there's so much evidence to suggest that actually the, yeah. the, the, the learning that you do is, is highly indicative of whether you continue to learn. Yeah. So the longer you stay in education, the more likely it is that you'll come yeah. back to it. Um, so as a, as a single intervention that will then underpin things like. Uh, better health, better work, work prospects, getting people engaged in education, wanting to stay in education and able to, I think at the, at the beginning of their careers, I think that would make a massive difference. Okay. 
first? Uh, mine's very simple. Government needs to make mandatory accessible housing standards. On my slide I had the House Builders Federation are objecting to the current, I think it's 18 authorities, which are trying to introduce policies and you think, and say, there's no evidence. What? There's plenty of evidence. You don't have to look for it. Let's just make it mandatory. We need better housing. The house builders stop squealing. Get on with it. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Neil? Well, we'll focus on our own areas. I mean, I agree with all those. But I, I think um, access uh, was the point I made. I think in order to age well, uh, people, especially given that tailored mobility issue, which we're not going to get rid of in the next... 20 or 30 years it's about giving people access to, and, and that's not saying the same for everyone actually there are people in poorer communities who need access to more services and more support so it's an uneven picture but it is about giving people the right of access to good health and care support services which will enable them to live independent lives Great, well there are four very uh, concrete actions, some of those are things that Aging Better is actively working on, um, certainly the issue of getting uh, mandated uh, housing standards and uh, also uh, things around enabling people to stay and work longer and key to that is obviously uh, the issues around that we've heard around lifelong learning. So please do keep in touch with us, follow the work that we're doing, um, get involved um, and uh, help us to keep getting the message out there to different people that we can have a future of ageing uh, better, but we do need to take action now and uh, we know some of the things that could make a really big difference to how we all uh, live in the future. So thank you very much and please join me in thanking our great panel this morning.